Hello, and welcome to At The Bar, a podcast where we have unscripted conversations with our guests about legal news, topics, stories, and whatever else strikes our fancy. I'm your host, John Amarillo of Taft Law, and this is part two of our three-part series on the trial of the Chicago 7. In this episode, we continue our conversation with Dick Schultz, who represented the United States government in the prosecution of the Chicago 7. We recommend that you listen to the first part of the conversation before this part, but it's a free country and you can choose your own adventure. One additional note before we rejoin Dick, we realize that even 50 years later, this topic touches on deep-seated memories and emotions for those who supported and those who opposed the Chicago 1968 protests, the Vietnam War, and the prosecution of the Chicago 7. We don't take sides in that debate. We don't interrogate Dick or John. Our role in this interview series is to let both men explain to us and to you their recollections and views of the events those many years ago. And with that, let's pick up where we left off with Dick. So Dick, let's move the conversation on to the trial itself. It's my understanding that before the trial even began, one or more of the defendants were encouraging more violence at the trial. Is that correct? Yes, it is. It is. What were they saying? Let me just, before I tell you that, let me just give you an overview of the trial. The attorneys were Tom Florin, the United States attorney, and myself. Right. The way we tried the case was uh, we alternated witnesses. There were about 190 witnesses at the trial. I cross-examined and or direct examined approximately 90 of those witnesses. Tom did the other 90, approximately 90. I gave the opening statement and the closing argument. Tom gave the rebuttal. And the defense attorneys were William Kunstler and Leonard Weinglass. So those are the four attorneys. Prior to the trial starting, answer directly to, your, to your, your question. A week before the trial began, one of the defendants announced at a rally the following, quote, this is a rally. People should come to this trial and fight the pigs in Chicago just as they did a year ago. He also instructed the audience how to make a Molotov cocktail and told them to throw it into a pig's cut. I I hadn't even started it. By the way, that is evidence that we presented to the jury at the trial. Mm -hmm. You mentioned a Black Panther letter. Well, you know, that's one of the more famous episodes of the trial. And this was a a note that was supposedly sent by the Black Panthers to one or more of the jurors, right? That's correct. Can you describe that? The first witness that we had on the stand, who was an FBI agent, while he was testifying, we were all informed that a juror had received a letter from the Black Panthers threatening the juror's life. As soon as we learned that, Counselor Weinglass, Tom, and I went into chambers with the judge. I think that was the only time we were ever in chambers uh, with him. And we told the judge about it, and it was decided that the judge was going to interview the jurors to find out whether any of them could still remain as jurors. But lunchtime was coming. Before we broke up, Kunstler said, we have to keep this quiet. We can't let the jurors know about this. And we all, of course, agreed and understood. Mm -hmm. During the lunch hour, Kunstler, Weinglass, and all of the defendants, except for Seal, who was uh, in jail, so he had to go back to jail on on another case that was in, I think, Connecticut. He wasn't in jail because of us. Held a press conference on camera in the federal courthouse. And what he said was the jurors, he said jurors, plural, which surprised us, had received letters from the Black Panthers threatening their lives and that he believed the letters were sent not by the Black Panthers, but by the United States government. So now, after that, we now are in court out of the presence of the jurors. And he says the same thing to the judge. The judge, now knowing that these letters are known to the world and possibly through the media, if the jurors are exposed to the media, to jurors who never even received the letters, immediately sequestered the jurors. The jurors were sequestered at a downtown hotel for four and a half months on account of this. Four and a half months meaning they only could see their families on the weekends, and, and, and that was in the presence of U.S. Marshals, 
was just awful for them. Right. So he orders a Sikh restoration. And the next morning, oh, uh, oh, and later that afternoon, the jurors were interviewed and one juror was removed. Yeah. The following morning, Kunstler made a motion out of the presence of the jury for a hearing to determine the government's role in sending these letters. And he requested the judge order a number of witnesses to testify at this hearing, including J. Edgar Hoover <laughs> and the attorney yeah. general John Mitchell. Right. The judge denied the motion. But then that evening, it was on television again because they had, they had two press conferences a day, every day for the length right. of the trial. Repeatedly during the trial, after this occurred, in the presence of the jury, counselor would make a motion in the presence of the jury, make a motion to have the sequestration canceled, saying right. he never wanted it, it was terrible. Right, he provokes this scenario, and then he plays the white knight in front of the jury trying to get them out of it, right? And this is just from the first witness. This is the first witness at the trial, and you have all this drama already. This is, this is the first witness. Before the trial started, I asked the judge to order the defendants. They hadn't had any press conferences yet. And yeah. To order the defendants to comply with a rule that says that the attorneys cannot make public statements about the case. There's a local court rule that said attorneys can't come in on cases while they're pending, right? Precisely. Just says, no, you're not going to do that. There's a rule, and uh, he expects they will comply with it. <laughs> Every day after that, during the trial, two press conferences were held, would be held by them, all of them on television, except for Seal. He wasn't there. Right. And they would be analyzing what happened that morning or that afternoon, depending on when press conference occurred. At the end of the day, Tom and I watched the uh, evening program. We wouldn't even know we were at the same trial. It was so absurd. It, it, it wasn't even close. Dick, this is something I really wanted to ask you about, because those press conferences allowed the defendants to control the public narrative, the perception of how the trial was going, uh, right. to paint you and Tom and the government as the bad guys and them as the oppressed good guys who were just standing up for their constitutional rights, et cetera. What, if anything, did you or the judge do to stop them, to get them to comply with the local rule? I had made my motion. The judge had denied it. I was done. There was nothing more I could do. Couldn't you move for sanctions, something, you know, to hold them in contempt? I know they had a hundred or so contempt uh, rulings against them over the course of the trial. But... There were many other contempts. No, yeah. I we did not. The judge had made his decision. Tom and I never spoke one word publicly until after the verdict was issued. We came back into court and asked, can we now speak about it? And the yeah. judge authorized it. So you're right. Absolutely right. It was uh, the defendants and their lawyers controlled the media. It was awful. And moreover, the press wasn't just, just swallowed at all. Whatever they said. Well, it, I mean, in fairness, it was the only thing they were hearing, right? They saw the trial. Okay. They knew they knew that this didn't mimic the trial, but they didn't they didn't do anything except for one guy, Bill Curtis. Bill Curtis was a pressman. He had just passed the bar. I, I understand. Uh, he was at the trial, and he was the only yeah. one, only one, who did it fairly. It's a legendary Chicago newsman. Russians had a, had a reporter there. This was all going into Russia, for Christ's sake. Right. Well, I mean, it's great propaganda for them, right? The U.S. government's oppressing its own people, that kind of thing. Well, Dick, why didn't – and, you know, I, I know it's super easy for me to armchair quarterback this 52 years later, but did you consider using, like, proxies to speak to the press? I know you couldn't speak to the press because of the local rule, but sending someone out there to give your version of the events of the day to, to try to counter the narrative that the defendants were putting out there? It'd be a violation of the rule. Having someone else do it for me, not a chance. Not a chance. Not a chance. No, no. We just took it on the chin and got destroyed publicly. We knew it. Okay. Yeah. We had one audience that we cared about, the jury. That was it. Do we know to this day for sure who sent that note to the jurors? No, do I... Do you have your suspicions? 
I have no, I, I have no suspicions. I have no idea. I have no idea. Okay. So, you know, it was completely improper, but probably effective Kunstler's maneuver there. That wasn't the only time that he told the jury that they were in danger during the <laughs> trial, right? That's right. Shortly after that, it was like being on another planet, maybe in, a, in another universe. The jury was threatened again, not long after that. After the jury was seated, before the witness took the stand, Kunstler stood up and said to the judge, the jury's right next to him, and I'm quoting, he said, the government is planning to launch an attack on the jury. God, that's what he said. The judge hears this and he immediately orders the jury out of the courtroom. They all stood up and before they could even take a step, Kunstler said it again. Judge, the government is planning to launch an attack on the jury. And the jurors are all looking at him and looking at us, uh, stumbling out of the courtroom. They couldn't believe it. Couldn't believe it. Do you think they believed him? We never responded to it. Ever. What are we going to do? Stand up and say, no, judge, that's not true? No, no, no. But just you were there. You, you saw their faces. Were they rolling their eyes or did they look scared? They were in shock. Yeah. They were stoic. Later in the trial, Kunstler embellished on this. He informed the jury that Tom Foran and I were violent. Here's what happened. Again, just before the witness takes the stand, this was in, in the afternoon on one of these days, right after lunch, before the witness got up to get on the stand, the jury's impaneled, the judge is sitting there. He stands up and here's what he said, and I'm quoting. There was a fist fight, apparently, both in, in an elevator and the lunchroom. There's a lunchroom in, in, in the federal building. Between a federal marshal and a U.S. attorney, the government sometimes settles its problems with violence, as happened in the courthouse today. Well, that's, that's the quote. This was false. He just made it up. There was no fist fight. But the jurors, the only marshal and U.S. attorneys they know are sitting right, right there in the courtroom. Right. They're being told that Tom and I are violent and dangerous. Just all made up. <laughs> okay, so there was violence in the courtroom, though. It just wasn't coming from you guys, right? There was a very rowdy crowd in the gallery. Rowdy is an understatement. Yeah, I'm saying that with a touch of irony. <laughs> so it's my understanding that these disruptions from the gallery, from the spectators, followed a certain pattern, right? Yes, that's correct. What was that? Well, first, the spectators would line up outside the federal building every night. They were lines. They'd sleep out in the street. And we, we tried the case from September to um, February. It was cold. <laughs> yeah. When they got into the courtroom, they would yell, scream, clap, laugh, swear, cheer, groan, grunt, and ointe in the courtroom during the trial. One woman kept on yelling, you little prick, you little prick. I never knew whom she was addressing. It was incredible. It was like being at a football game to hear these, these, these screaming and yelling. Dick, was it constant or would it come at certain times in the trial? It wasn't constant, but it occurred over and over on a regular basis. And okay. yes, there were times when we could predict when it would occur. And I'll tell you about that in, in a moment. But what they would do is exactly what they did during the convention. They would start fighting in self-defense. And here's how it would work. And it happened over and over again. I'm talking about the spectators. A woman, usually, who was near the back of the rows and not close to the aisle, so it would be hard to get to her, would start screaming and yelling without stop. The marshal would tell her, he'd be standing in the aisle to stop it, and she wouldn't. So he'd start moving in to take her out, take her out of the spectator section. And of course, he had to get by everybody who wouldn't allow him. Yeah. He'd finally get to her, and he would cut her shoulder or her arm or her elbow, whatever it is, and she would immediately fight, push him back. How dare he touch her? 
in self-defense. She's defending herself. Mm -hmm. And then the people in the area, the spectators around her, would come to her aid and push the marshal and start fighting with him. Other marshals would come in and join. And it would explode into a fight in the spectator section, which on many occasions would morph into the well of the courtroom. <laughs> and we in the middle of the courtroom would have people punching and kicking and fighting and screaming. And as soon as that started, the judge would order the jury to leave. Yeah. They would all stand up and start gradually moving out, looking over their shoulder. Yeah, they want to watch. It's a show. They would leave very slowly. Yeah. <laughs> the fighting was incredible. It was wrestling. It was it was yeah. kicking. It was biting. I mean, it was wild. And wouldn't wouldn't the defendants get in on the fighting at, oh, at some yeah. points? Oh, yeah. in the well of the courtroom. Oh, yes. Yeah. On one occasion, I remember so vividly, it happened while I was at the podium. So I put my elbow on the podium and I looked over my shoulder and I was watching it. And Rennie Davis, one of the defendants, came up to me and stuck his face right in my face. So behind him is all this battling and he's got his nose in my nose. He had bad breath, by the way. He's saying, come on. He holds his jaw up. Hit me, hit me, hit me. I didn't. Were you tempted? I, I you just, were tempted. Admit it. Oh, of course. Oh, of course. Yeah. I, we all grew up our, our own ways, of course. <laughs> and he knew that. Of course, I didn't do anything. Right. On one occasion, what would happen, I mean, as soon as the jury got out, and it took him a while every time, the judge would promptly run out, and you could see his, he's a little guy. You'd just, just see his head running out. The court reporter would run out. Mm -hmm. And there would be nothing in the transcript. Sometimes she would say disruption, but generally there's nothing in the transcript. On one occasion, I remember this as vividly as could be, while they were all fighting, Abby Hoffman climbed up on the back of the front row visitor's bench, and he balanced himself on top of the bench so that his feet were on it and his hands were on either side. And he was squatting there, facing the fighting in the well of the courtroom. And in front of him, was a marshal with his back to, a big, big marshal with his back to Abby Hoffman fighting with someone facing the marshal. Abby mm -hmm. Hoffman leaped off the top of that bench, sprung off, came down with a rabbit punch on the back of the marshal's neck, and the marshal went down out, out cold. It was like a barroom brawl in, in a Western movie. How many times did this happen, Dick? over the course of the four and a half month trial? At least 15 to 20 times. Okay, so yeah, pretty regularly. You, you said earlier that you could predict when these things, these disruptions, these barroom brawls would happen. How so? What do you mean by that? Tom and I would look at each other when we knew it was gonna happen. I'll give you one illustration. This was a coordination between the spectators and the defendants. On the witness stand on this occasion, the defendants who insisted that they never told the city officials that they wanted to have sex in the park, they said that was all a lie, all the testimony, that that's what they said, testimony from the city officials who had already, already mm -hmm. testified, said that's what happened. The defendants opposed it. They said that never happened. They put on the witness stand the man who did the negotiations for their permits. They're not putting their, their case on. And on direct examination, he produced a single piece of papers, little, just one little piece of paper with 10 paragraphs on it, numbered one through 10. And they offered it into evidence and it went into evidence and he's using it for his testimony because he wrote these notes during his negotiations with the city. Right. So he read the first five paragraphs on direct examination. Now it's our turn. I'm on cross-examination. So I, asked him about paragraph nine. They hadn't read paragraph nine. They asked what, about one through five. They objected that it was irrelevant, a document that's in evidence. <laughs> this is a rule of completeness problem there. It's in evidence. Right. The whole thing is the, the, the whole thing. Yeah, you can't pick and choose. Right. So the, the motion is denied. So he's reading aloud, and I'm going to quote it. 
paragraph nine. It states, quote, this is what he wrote while he's negotiating. Yep. There will be public fornication whenever and wherever there is an aroused appendage and a willing aperture. That's what he wrote while he was negotiating with his permits to sleep in the park. As soon as he's starting to read this, a visitor, a spectator, starts screaming and yelling and disrupting. Kunstler jumps out of his seat. Kunstler didn't even put this witness on direct examination. Screaming, what are they doing to this, this, this spectator? And the whole courtroom went up. Finally, it, it settles down. The spectator is taken out. Maybe five minutes have passed. And I realizing that probably the jury never even heard this witness. Right. Or if they did, they don't remember. I mean, it was, it was a wild scene. So I asked him to read paragraph nine again, which he did. And as he was reading it, Kunstler, again, who didn't even present this witness, when last did, said this, that I am using, quote, that dirty old man's tactic, unquote, whatever that meant. <laughs> this is one instance where there was coordination. Yeah. So they were using it, if I'm hearing you correctly, Dick, they were, the defense was using these disruptions, timing these disruptions to interfere with moments where you were making a good point. Is that fair? Sure. Often they would just start screaming and yelling when a good point was made. Liar, that kind of thing. But yes, yeah. that's what they would do. And... The defendants themselves were always screaming and yelling. Here are some of the things that they were saying to the judge. Just a few of them. Sure. Judge Hoffman, you equal Adolf Hitler today. You're the laughing stock of the world, Julius Hoffman. You are a disgrace to the Jews. You would have served Hitler better. Every kid in the world hates you. This court is bullshit, fascist. You're a Nazi tyrant. You know you cannot win this fucking case. They're screaming this out of the judge during the trial. You're a disgrace. You're a rotten liar. You're a fascist pig liar. You're an obscene hypocrite. You're a liar. You stink. The courtroom is a neon oven. You're a racist. That's, yeah. Every day. Every day. This is just a smattering of yelling and screaming from the defense table. These are defendants doing this. Slight lack of decorum there. But then the question is, what did the defendant's lawyers do to put them in check? Well, the judge would ask the lawyers to control their clients. And I'll give you one example, just one. The judge asked Wineglass to tell Reuben to be quiet. And here's what Wineglass's statement was. Quote, I am an officer of this court. I am not a U.S. Marshal. That was his answer. Yeah. They did nothing. They Obviously encouraged. And that's probably a good place for us to take a break. We'll be right back. This episode of At The Bar is brought to you by CourtFiling.net, your solution for filing in over 100 courts in the state of Illinois. CourtFiling.net provides a better e-filing experience, focusing on speed and ease of use in the e-filing process. CourtFiling.net is affordable and offers 24-7 phone, email, and chat support. Visit us at CourtFiling.net to receive 30 days unlimited free electronic filings and see why it's the best solution for your firm. Let CourtFiling.net worry about your e-filing so you can get back to taking care of your clients. Do you have a legal matter that you need resolved but want to avoid the expense of going to court? The litigation process can be stressful and costly, but there's another solution, mediation. The Chicago Bar Association Mediation Service enables you to choose a qualified attorney mediator to help resolve your business or legal dispute efficiently and for a reasonable fee. All participating attorneys have been fully vetted by the Chicago Bar Association. They have undergone an extensive training process to ensure that they provide the highest quality service and can guide you to an amicable resolution of your dispute. Call 312-554-2040 or email mediation at chicagobar.org to get started with the Chicago Bar Association Mediation Service today. And we're back. Dick, a lot of those attacks were launched at the judge, Julius Hoffman. Let's go there. He's portrayed in the movie and is often remembered, I think in part because of the, the later appellate court opinion from the Seventh Circuit, as really being part of the problem with the trial, 
And ultimately, his rulings provided some grounds for the defendant's convictions ultimately to be overturned. Let's not go there yet, but let me just ask you, how do you remember the judge handling himself and conducting the trial and his responses to the defendant's behavior? What do you think of the way he conducted the trial? He did his best. He did his best to keep order in the courtroom and to prevent the disruptions. And he he failed. I don't know any judge who would not fail. Now, he made some mistakes, and he was criticized during the trial for it. For example, he had a friend whose name was Feinglass. And at the beginning, he was always referring to Weinglass as Mr. Feinglass. He referred to defendant Weiner as Wiener. Mm-hmm. And he got confused with Dillinger's name. He called him Dillinger. He called what Dillinger. He made a mistake. Right. He was careful. He was assaulted verbally every day, viciously, and just sat there and sat there. And he was maligned every single day. I felt sorry for him. Yeah. He had no method of stopping it. There was nothing he could do. Maybe another judge would find a way of laughing these things off or whatever. Judge Hoffman didn't laugh them off. He just took it. Well, his conduct, Dick, brings us to, I think, one of the most difficult and indelible images of the trial that has a lot of resonance today. And that's the binding and the gagging of Bobby Seale, who is the only black defendant. So let, let's get into that a little bit. It's generally understood that Seale was bound and gagged because he was trying to represent himself at the trial when he said he did not have an attorney. Is that accurate? Did he have a lawyer at the trial? Uh, the answer is yes, he did. And you said, let's get into it a little bit. No, I want to get into it carefully. It has never, ever been analyzed by any judge or any lawyer. Never. Let's do it now. And I'm prepared, and I'm going to do it. It's going to sound maybe a little uh, heavy, but it's very, really very simple. The first thing everyone recalls is the binding and gagging and how terrible it was. It was accomplished by counselors' repeated lies to the judge and refusal to comply with the judge's order. And I'm going to tell you how it happened. It all started at the beginning with two lawyers licensed in California to file appearances for Bobby Seale. One was Charles Gary and the other was Michael Tiger. They were general appearances. Gary later sought a continuance of the trial, which was set for September 24th, because he, he had was having a surgery. Yeah. Having surgery. And his motion was denied. The trial was going to go ahead, so he was out. Okay. The counselor had filed appearances at the arraignment in April for a number of the defendants. And right. Had the case from the very beginning. On the morning of September 24th, the first day of the trial, in the presence of all eight defendants, including Seal, the defendant's local counsel named Birnbaum informed Judge Hoffman that Kunstler had filed an appearance that morning for Seal. And here's what he said. Kunstler will be Seal's, quote, trial counsel throughout the whole trial, unquote. That's what he said. Then Kunstler on that morning, who was standing at the podium, said he had been, who had been representing other defendants, said that prior to appearing in court that morning on the 24th of September, he filed his appearance on behalf of Seal, along with his Rule 30 affidavit, which he moved to appear per hoc vice. And just, just to pause you for one quick moment, Dick, for our audience, those who are not lawyers. So what that means is that Kunstler filed um, an appearance on Seal's behalf, and when he did so, he swore under oath that he was Seal's lawyer, correct? Quote, retain, unquote, by Seal. Okay. That's what it says. Okay. That's what it says. So the judge hears this, and at that morning, the judge, sua sponte, meaning on his own motion, granted Kunstler's leave to file his appearance for Seal, non pro tonque, meaning he's backdating for the right. Kunstler. The judge then asked Kunstler and Weinglass, who represents what? what who Which of the defendants? Kunstler yeah. said this, Mr. Wein, I'm quoting, 
Weinglass will be represented by four of the defendants, and I will be representing four of the defendants, unquote. Didn't identify them by name, but when you layer it with the affidavit and the appearance, it's clear that Kunstler was representing Seal, right? We have, we have the appearance. And Seal was there in the courtroom when he said this, correct? So if, if he disagreed, he presumably could have objected. Ron, that's correct. He's sitting right there. Okay. Okay. So that changed at some point. A few weeks into the trial, Weinglass finishes his cross-examination of a government witness. Upon completing that examination, Weinglass said to the judge, Seal should conduct the cross-examination of the witness on his behalf because he is not represented by counsel. Counsel is just sitting there saying nothing. First you've heard of it. Right. Seal, so the judge says that Kunstler has filed an appearance on behalf of Seal. And Kunstler said, and I'm quoting, with statements as to the limits of my appearance, unquote. And Judge Hoffman says, quote, there's no such thing as limits, unquote. By the way, Kunstler never told us what those limits were. Yeah. And they weren't in the appearance themselves, right? Just to be clear and complete. He didn't write anything in the appearance saying limiting his, purportedly no. limiting his representation no, 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 at all. Okay. okay. So the only known statement that we had was local counsel saying that counsel is going to represent Seal throughout the whole trial. Right. Even if counselor had made statements, verbal statements, or even written statements modifying his appearance. There was no procedure for that at that time. It's once you file an appearance, the only way you can limit it or eliminate it is with a ruling of court. Right. And that, of course he had no ruling. Right. All right. Ten days later, after this incident, the issue came up again. Kunstler said, I don't have a lawyer. And now Kunstler gave a different reason. He said, he told the judge that he had, quote, fully and legally withdrawn, unquote, his appearance. He no longer said limiting statements. Now he's fully withdrawn. But you can't, again, just for our audience, Dick, he can't withdraw his appearance without leave or permission of the court to do so. And that's almost never granted by courts unless there's substitute counsel who's coming in for that lawyer, right? Yeah, that's one of the principal reasons. The following day after he made this statement that he had fully and legally withdrawn, the following day, he made a motion to withdraw his appearance, a formal motion. This is four and a half weeks into the trial. 16 witnesses have testified. And he now moves to withdraw his appearance. Yeah. There was a, a lengthy hearing on that motion. Tom Foran argued it against Kunstler. The judge denied the motion. Several days later, when the issue came up again, Seal says, I don't have a lawyer. Kunstler stood up and said, I've withdrawn my appearance. He just had his motion to withdraw denied. I've right. withdrawn my appearance. That as though there never had been a ruling by the court that he couldn't. Right. It's just nuts. So he's, he's essentially not recognizing the authority of the court. That's basically what it boils down to. And he's lying to the court, saying right. that he had withdrawn it, saying that he had made statements. So now if everything is getting ratcheted up. Right. He was demanding that he can represent himself. Here are some of the things he said to the judge. I'm quoting Look, old man, if you keep on denying me my constitutional rights, you are being exposed to the public and the world as a racist, fascist, and bigot. The courtroom became utter chaos. We couldn't even proceed with the trial. Spectators and defendants were energized by the turmoil. There was yelling, swearing. It was unbelievable. Now I have to take you back before the trial. Six weeks before our trial started, that is in August, of 1969, before the trial started. The Seventh Circuit, which is the circuit that Judge Hoffman is in and we're in, right. made a ruling in what's called Illinois versus Allen. In that case, Allen was a defendant in, in, in a proceeding, and he was disrupting the trial badly. They couldn't proceed. The court ordered him out of the courtroom, removed from the courtroom. And he claimed, Allen did, his Sixth Amendment right was violated. The Seventh Circuit, six weeks before our trial began, ruled 
that a disruptive defendant cannot be removed from the courtroom. He has to be bound and gagged. That's what it ruled. Tom and I were aware of the case, and we saw it coming weeks before when Kunstler first claimed that his appearance had been withdrawn. They were using, they were, they were building a case under Allen. Right. So with the Seventh Circuit, as I understand it, said, so this, like you said, this is the month before trial started, and they said that the proper remedy when you have a disruptive defendant who's not allowing the trial to proceed is to, quote, have restrained the defendant by whatever means necessary, even if those means included his being shackled and gagged, close quote. Now, that was later overturned by the U.S. Supreme Court the following year, which disagreed with that conclusion. But when you went to trial, that was the law in the courtroom that you were in. While our case was on trial, that case was argued before the United States Supreme Court. Right. And I'm told, I wasn't there, that most of the argument concerned our case, what was going on in Chicago at that time. In March of 1970, the Supreme Court reversed the Seventh Circuit. Right. It said it was not a violation of the Sixth Amendment right of a defendant to remove him from the courtroom. He could be removed, and that was proper. Right. They said the judge actually has discretion to either remove him, to cite him for contempt, or to bind and gag him, and that he didn't have to bind and gag him, which, when you were at trial, was the law of the Seventh Circuit. The only way we could have proceeded with the trial was to bind and gag him, because we couldn't remove him from the court. I say we, the judge, couldn't remove right. him from the court. So the charade, the charade that Kunstler and Seal executed was they saw a ruling, and the only way to get the ruling to apply was for Kunstler to unilaterally withdraw his appearance, blame it on the, on the judge, uh, that not letting him do it, and letting Seal disrupt the courtroom and be bound and gagged so that the whole world would see this black man in a federal court sitting in a chair with a gag on, bound and gagged, and that's exactly what happened. And it happened through the repeated lies and deceit and refusal to comply with the judge's orders, all by counseling. Dick, let me, so let, let's. There, there, there's one thing. So they, I, perpetrated, yeah, they perpetrated, John, a fraud on the court and Seal submitted to the sham. He submitted to it. He let it happen to him. Yeah. And they did it. They did it to reveal to the world that an American federal court is morally depraved and racist. They did it by manipulation, lies, and cheating. And no one has ever called them out on it. No one has ever analyzed how this came about. And I've told you how it came about. So let me, let, let's, okay. I know there's going to be disagreement on that point, whether this was part of a trap by the defense. Um, what else could it be? I'm not taking sides. I just, I know uh, I've heard both of them. Uh, I'm trying to be neutral in this. No one, but. Has ever, no one has ever analyzed that. No, 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 no. It's not something where there's another side to it. These are the facts that occurred. No one has okay. ever addressed them. They said, a district court, that awful Judge Hoffman has done this. They never have seen how it developed. Okay. So let, let's take that as true then, Dick. You, and, you off the top think, well, maybe there's another side to it. What is the other side? No one has ever said no, because there isn't, all you have to do is look at the transcript. All right. Well, but if, if we take that as true and agree well, with didn't, you on that, didn't, why, didn't, let me, didn't, here's, didn't, here's my I, question. No, John, Dick, I did not make up the, the, the quotes. I'm not, from, I'm not, I am not accusing you of making up anything. I no, just, it, I'm saying it's true. I, it's I, true. I, okay. But taking that, taking that as true, Dick, here's my question. It still seems to me that Bobby Seal was treated differently than the other defendants who, as you've laid out, you know, very articulately before, were incredibly disruptive throughout the trial, including getting in fistfights with marshals. So if, I mean, the question's pretty simple. Why wasn't Abby Hoffman bound and gagged when he jumped on the back of a marshal and started punching him? Why wasn't this Seventh Circuit rule being equally applied to all of the defendants? Because all of the defendants had didn't do what Seal did. Yes, the defendants did disrupt. In fact, Dellinger was, had his bond taken away, and he spent the last part of the trial in jail. 
in jail. Yeah. The other defendants were interrupting the trial, but they weren't stopping the trial. Bobby Seale stopped our trial. We could not proceed. Why? Why was this different than the other ones? He, he stood before the jury. He stood before the jury after they finally the binding and gagging was removed. And he, representing himself, here's what he said to a witness, a police officer who on direct examination never even talked about Black Panthers, didn't even know who they were probably. He screams, Seal does, in his cross-examination. Have you ever killed a Black Panther Party member? Have you ever been on any raids in the Black Panther offices? I mean, he was just screaming and yelling and tearing at the... We couldn't proceed with the trial. That's when he was... But but Dick, how, how is that different than what the other defendants were doing when they were calling Judge Hoffman a Nazi and a fascist? And they're screaming and disrupting too. I guess I'm struggling with finding what the difference is between their behavior. Well, the difference is really very clear. They would scream out. There would be a disruption. Maybe it last for, if it was a fist fight, it might last for 15, 20 minutes. But normally it lasted only a very short time. Yeah. And then we proceeded with the trial. Seal was standing up and screaming all the time. We couldn't put witnesses on. We couldn't get any evidence in. So the difference is he wouldn't stop screaming at any point. Is that what he you're saying? He didn't stop screaming. My okay. First Amendment rights are being violated in this fascist court. And he, 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 he charged me on one occasion. He, he screamed at me and charged across the courtroom, screaming at me. Fortunately, fortunately for one of us, a marshal stepped in between us. We couldn't proceed. The trial stopped. That was the difference. There was no discrimination. Okay. He was mistrialed out after that, right? Yep. yep. So that, that's how we that's how we get the moniker the Chicago Seven and not the Chicago Eight, right? Right. He's mistried now, I don't know, two months later, whenever it was. Well, before he's mistried, we had presented evidence about what he had done. Yeah. He had two speeches. Uh, we had a tape of the first speech, which was not a complete tape. And it was a messed up tape. That's a, a speech that he made on Tuesday night in, uh, in Lincoln Park after being in, introduced by Rubin to 2000. He spoke to 2000 demonstrators. Our recording was not good. And then he had another speech in um, Grant Park the next day. Now, we presented that evidence. Seal is now mistried. Now they bring Seal back to testify. They bring him back to testify. And he takes the stand and he testifies to his speech in Lincoln Park, Mm -hmm. the first speech, the one that Rubin introduced him to. Mm -hmm. And he produces a complete recording. They had a complete recording of his speech and a transcript of his speech. So now I have the complete Story. I didn't have it before. Yeah, and they're handing you your evidence. So now on cross-examination, here's what he tells us. He told the crowd, running around in large groups with rocks and bottles won't accomplish anything against the pigs. Get a 357 Magnum pistol, a 45 pistol, and an M1 rifle. Go in small groups of four and five and use revolutionary tactics. These groups will disassemble those pigs who occupy our community like foreign troops. If a pig treats you unjustly, bring out your pieces and start barbecuing some pork. (laughs) They put him on the stand to say all this on cross-examination, of course. In the second rally on cross-examination, I asked Seal whether the following occurred. Here's the question and here's what happened. Question, did you state while pointing at a policeman, he's an out in, in Grant Park on Wednesday, and Wednesday before the march to the amphitheater was supposed to go ahead. Did you state while pointing at a policeman standing nearby, quote, if the pigs get in the way of our march, meaning the march to the amphitheater, yeah. then tangle with the blue helmeted motherfuckers and kill them and send them to a morgue slab. They brought them back, <laughs> incredible. He refused to answer the question and in the presence of the jury took the Fifth Amendment. Certainly undermines their position that they were meant to be peaceful. So, Dick, let's talk about 
you're talking about a, a pretty memorable witness there. One of the things this trial's famous for is having a lot of memorable witnesses, including, you know, the uh, all the celebrities of the counterculture movement. Uh, you had Norman Mailer, Allen Ginsberg, Timothy Leary, Judy Collins, Phil Oakes, Jesse Jackson. Who stands out for you? 52 years later, looking back on it, who's most memorable for you? Well, one of them, Phil Oakes. I had to keep my, my, my family unknown to the defendants. My 10-year-old daughter happened to be there when Phil Oakes testified. Uh, he got up on the stand with his uh, guitar. Kunstler asked him to sing a song that he had sung during the convention. Uh, I stood up and said that I objected to him singing in the courtroom, and my daughter screams out, Aw, Daddy, let him sing. <laughs> the very human moment. That was, she ultimately became a prosecuting attorney. Abby Hoffman was probably yeah. the all the best. When Abby took the stand when the defendants put him on, he had blown kisses to the jury when in the first day of the trial. He, on direct examination, the first question was, what occurred in your life from uh, 1938 to 1960? He answered, nothing. He was a showman, a comedian on direct examination. He was endearing. He, he said how much he enjoyed the music. He came to peacefully demonstrate. It never crossed his mind that there'd be violence. He was a lover, not a fighter. He was so ingratiating. He was so good. He was so good. Didn't he challenge Mayor Daly to a fight in the middle of the courtroom? Yeah, he did. Out of the presence of the jury. And Daly yeah. li lifted his dukes. Yeah. Put his dukes up. Yeah. It was, it was funny. <laughs> and then everything changed on his cross-examination. He couldn't explain how he planned peaceful demonstrations when, prior to the convention, he wrote there'd be 6,000 arrests, two to 3,000 beatings, and 20 to 30 people killed. He couldn't. What happened on cross-examination is that he had never in his life had to answer a question. Never. He can always duck, dodge. But here, I would ask him a question, and he would deflect. I would very mm -hmm. politely ask the answer be stricken. It would be, and I'd ask it again. And then again, and again, and again, till he had to answer the questions. And he couldn't. And he became sullen, reticent, subdued, angry. He was completely different than on, on, on his direct examination. This happened over and over again. I'd just keep on asking him, and he would just collapse. It finally became so bad, uh, they had to hospitalize him. We had to take a recess for, I can't remember how many days, because he said he was ill. He went to the hospital. On his direct examination, Weinglass never asked him what occurred after Wednesday, the 26th of August, left out Thursday and Friday. Mm -hmm. So I started asking him about after Wednesday, and they objected, and the judge said, well, you opened it up because you denied the, everything charged against you in the indictment on your direct examination, and that included Thursday. So now I get to it. On Thursday, the government had previously... We had previously presented evidence that at the Logan statue in Grant Park, there's a General Logan sitting on his horse and it's up on a hill. The horse is, the whole statue is up on a hill. And they testified that Hoffman had, with a megaphone, when a whole crowd was at that statue on Thursday, he had said, we have the big cheese now, meaning Rochford, let's kidnap him, take him to the amphitheater and snuff him if the police touch us. And the crowd began surging up after Rochford, who had gone up the hill to get some people off the horse. So, so he was saying that the crowd should take the police superintendent hostage, basically. And snuff him if the police get in the way. Right. So now we have Hoffman on cross-examination on Thursday, this happened on Thursday, they left it out on the direct examination. And I asked him, well, he categorically denied anything about kidnapping Rochford or inciting the crowd to charge up the hill. So this book that I mentioned before, Revolution for the Hell of It, he wrote, he wrote that he urged the crowd to kidnap Rochford. And if the police interfered, he announced, I'll kill the top pig and I meant it. That's what he wrote. Mm. 
So now mm -hmm. we're on cross-examination and I bring him to his book and it was pathetic. Yes, I, I, I don't remember who I am. It was just, it was all a blur to him. The jury saw it so clearly that they had left out Thursday in the direct examination because that was all before them that he had lied on his cross-examination that he didn't do this and he wrote it in the book and then finally he wrote in his book that he wanted to smash this system by any means at his disposal he wanted to wreck this fucking society he was totally destroyed it was sad to yeah. see actually it was pathetic so here's a man who, who had the jury in his palm and who was totally destroyed totally destroyed so dick the, the jury looks at all the evidence that we've been discussing and they found five of the seven defendants davis dellinger hayden hoffman and rubin guilty of traveling between states with the intent to incite a riot they acquitted all seven of them of conspiracy and acquitted freunds and weiner on all charges and then Judge Hoffman also convicted all of the defendants and their attorneys, Kunstler and Weinglass, on 159 counts of criminal contempt, imposing sentences that ranged from months to years on all of them. The Seventh Circuit, which is the, the appellate court, reversed on appeal the convictions and the contempt charges. Some of those contempt charges were tried again, and uh, the defendants and their attorneys were found guilty of them, but the district court that heard that case didn't impose prison sentences or fines. And that is going to be our show for today. I want to thank our guest, Dick Schultz, for this truly fascinating look back on one of the most unique trials in American history. This was a rare opportunity, uh, and I'm thankful for it, Dick. I know you don't give many interviews. I really enjoyed it, and I think our audience will feel the same way. Thank you. You're welcome. I also want to thank our executive producer, Jen Byrne of the CBA, Adam Lockwood on sound, and everyone at the Legal Talk Network family. Remember, you can follow us and send us comments, questions, episode ideas, or just troll us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at CBA at the bar, all one word. Please also rate and leave us your feedback on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you download our podcast. It helps us get the word out. Until next time, for everyone here at the CBA, thank you for joining us, and we'll see you soon at the bar. Need a lawyer? Steve? I do. You look like you need a lawyer. The Chicago Bar Association Lawyer Referral Service has been making referrals for over 70 years to attorneys who have been thoroughly screened for experience in over 40 different areas of the law. Call 312-554-2001 or visit us online at www.chicagobar.org backslash LRS.